people for coming in and doing the show. Um, and I'm here to talk to you today about oh, it's still Scary Storm. Who's been pronouncing it Sky Root? It's a scary, and it comes yes. from the dark word colourful. Because traditionally, or as has been discovered through the research that we did for the Tales of the Taishir album, there were three stones. And if, it, if you've heard the album, you would have heard Debbie going on about the use of three stones and what they put and what that chant part is taken directly from the scary stones practice. Um, and where, I'll kind of talk about where it kind of originated from and the, the way it was woven together. And you can check out the resources and the, the, the references that I'll give you yourselves. Um, then what I'll do is I'll focus on two characters from the Scottish Witch Trials who are, I really like them. They're like my favourite people I think I've read about, actually. Um, but as Julie was saying this morning, the fact that they were trialed as witches means they didn't have a very good ending. But how they got there with these two particular characters is very, very interesting. And unusual, I would probably say. So, um, in terms of the, the, the scary stones, they're, they're also termed in one of the witchcraft trials as slake stones. And slake is an old Scottish word for release. Mm -hmm. So you slake your, slake your sails. Does that, yeah, do you all know what I'm saying for that? So, when we were doing the research for the, when I was doing the research for the album to, to hand over to Debbie and Amanda, these stories about these stones, three stones and these colours of stones kept popping up all over the place. So the first the first reference I found was in Williams Mackenzie's Gallic Incantations, Charms and Blessings of the Hebrides. So that's where they first came up. And William Mackenzie talks about these weird three stones and was talking about the colour of these three stones. Um, but there wasn't actually much else within that bit of literature. And then James McKinley and uh, the folklore of the Scottish Locks and Springs talks about these three stones in the bottom of a well. They used to, I'm going to spin around, I'm not going to spin around. <laughs> they spin around in the bottom of the well, and uh, I'm not sure I'm giving the story justice, but people used to go and they would take a bucket of water and they would scoop up one of these stones that was spinning around in the well, and they would take it and they would go and heal whoever it was that needed healing. And then they'd chop back. And they put the stone back in the well and it would start spinning around again. And I think in James McKinley's stories, and don't quote me on this, someone tried to heal their goat and the yeah. stone didn't like it and it stopped working. So that I do not heal goats. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's also uh, Donald Mackenzie's Scotch Folklore and Folklife, he mentions that to you. Um, and interestingly, there is a similar practice found in Trolldom. Do you all know what Trolldom is? It's a, a Norse folk practice, Trolldom. It's like the overall name for it. And within Trolldom, there's a practice called Stemprof. I'm not going to do it. Accent, no justice. You probably do. It's a stone test, yeah. Stemprof. Or stone test. Cool, Yeah, thank you. Which is very similar, but within Trolldom, and Johannes has written about it in the form that we don't have. He's kind of, what I would say, weaponized it, because he has four stones. We only have three stones in Scotland. So with all this in mind, I was kind of looking through all of this stuff, and I was thinking, right, there's something about these three stones that's really, really significant. So I started to look at the witchcraft shop. And thank you very much to Julian Gooder's Scottish Survey of Witchcraft, because it has saved me years of work. If you're ever curious about if something happens in a witchcraft, is, go on to the Scottish Survey of Witchcraft, type in whatever it is, and it will bring up every single reference in any single witch trial that you would look at across the whole staff. Yeah, we can that with all the quotes. Yeah, and he's writing another one as well, which is going to kind of bring it together. And I've actually given him the, the trial that we'll talk about. I got it transcribed and I helped transcribe it. It's like ages. So, the, the witchcraft trials that we're going to be looking at are. Catherine Cravey, and if anyone's listened to the album, you'll start to recognize who that is. Um, and uh, a man called Alexander Drummond. These are the two we're going to look at. But within the other witchcraft trials in Scotland, these stones are mentioned by Catherine K 
Kerry, James Croxton, <laughs> Margaret Sanderson, and Jenny Craig. And these witchcraft trials span between 1617 and all the way up to 1649. So it's a practice that was happening across Scotland, because they used them from different areas for quite a long time. So, Alexander Drummond. <laughs> we'll start there. Alexander Drummond, um, sadly I wasn't able to include so much information about Alexander Drummond, because the amount of information in his witchcraft trial was huge. Um, and then I got it all transcribed, and I had it all ready, and then I spoke to Dr. Bidair about it, and he said, oh yeah, I've got that. <laughs> 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 but not as many as you've got. You've got more information than I have. And I was like, that would have been really helpful, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so what this is what this is here is this is a really sad letter. Why Alexander Drummond is why I find witchcraft trials so interesting is he was the only one that I found that people ask for the posthumous pardon for him because uh, they wanted to kind of share that he was a notable Christian and did all his wondrous cures by lawful means. Um, and this is in this letter here. Um, I'm not going to read it out because I have, but at the top it says, Loving Mother, and then to the bottom it says, To Almighty God, or your loving mother. And there's two pictures of, well, there's two copies of the letters that I have, which is the one says, basically, Hey, loving brother, Alexander Drummond is not an evil man. Let's just excuse him for what he did. The other letter says, Hey, loving brother, tell him don't agree with you. <laughs> in brief, see you later. But um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit more about Alexander Drummond's witchcraft trial, Catherine Cleary's witchcraft trial, on, on my website, the Kayak Severian. Um, and you'll be able to kind of read more about this story because it is really, really fascinating. And it's notable for that reason. One, they try to say that he wasn't doing things to be devil's name, but also he's a guy. And he's a folk healer, and not often do we come across a witchcraft trial involving a guy. In fact, he almost didn't get tried. They had to move him from where he lived down to Edinburgh. I think it was Perth that, that, that originally started that He was, um, <coughs> let me just find it. Yeah, he was uh, investigated by the ministers of Dunfermline on 31st of May 1624. But because up to rather prosperity, Casca, Casca, my church, <laughs> he had so much support where he lived, they couldn't do anything to him in, in Dunfermline. They shifted him to Edinburgh. Um, and what maybe shifted his confession, well, it wasn't his confession, what shifted why he was arrested for, into witchcraft rather than folk healing and charming is because his neighbour or someone, heard him say once that his mom sold him to the devil. <laughs> and he might have mentioned just once to the same person that he had a familiar spirit. That switched from charming and folk healing into the case of Malachi Healing and Witchcraft. That's all it took, that one kind of little confession. But he was super interesting because he said he was more powerful than the church. Because I can bring people help. You can't do that. You just bury people. Um, he also carried out uh, an unlawful exorcism on a young boy that would work really well. Mm -hmm. But what's quite interesting, why I'm bringing up Alexander Drummond's tale, is because of the use of the stones, and it's only Alexander Drummond that refers to them as snake stones. So, yes. Well, Alexander. Catherine Craigie, she's my lady. I love Catherine Craigie. She's like, she's one of my favourite characters I think I've ever, ever, ever met. Well, I had the privilege of reading the story in a uh, witch child. Catherine Craigie comes from Orkney. This is a beach of Orkney. It's um, Catherine Craigie was a folk healer of sorts. Um, and Catherine Craigie used three stones. Um, she doesn't call them what they are, but she referred to them as. Can you, can you, think, can you guess what she might refer to them as? I've heard the album, this is a text. <laughs> <laughs> she referred to them as the hill stain the water stain, and the kirk stain. And I found this really, really interesting, because in terms of cosmology, we're kind of in the, in the world of magic and the land of magic. We're kind of used to referring to like earth, air, fire, and water. 
Here she's referring to the sea, the earth, and the sky. I'm always worried that I say something twice. Not only her, when I looked at the other witchcraft trials, the ebbstone and the kirkstone and the hillstone all kind of came up. I'll touch on why that's important in the kind of sense of cosmology in a second. But what's interesting about Catherine, and I love Catherine Kidd, if you read her trial, you can get a real sense of what kind of character she is. And it's like men as well. <laughs> she got trialed twice. The first time she was found not guilty. And this is when she was talking about the hillstones and the kirkstones and the hillstones. And they came up again later. But in the first trial, Catherine Craigie was accused of putting a curse spirit on Donna Craigie's husband. Because I don't actually think Catherine liked Donna Craigie's husband very much. But Catherine repented and said, yes, sorry, I prayed and a curse spirit attached to you. And I'll remove it. I'm really sorry. Because I'm jealous. That's what she said. In the so, um, back up, walk to trial. There's other bits and pieces that kind of went on. Um, and then it kind of, okay, Catherine, you're fine. You didn't do any of You're not going to burn you. Cancel the ashes. Two years later, Catherine Craig had been kind of at it again. Apparently, uh, she uh, heard John Craigie speaking ill of her witchcraft ability, or let people know about her witchcraft. So she caused a huge boil on Janet Craig's face. In fact, it was so big, it disfigured the right side of her face. But Catherine felt quite sorry about this. She said, you shouldn't be talking ill of me, but what I'll do is I'll create something called trial food. In this trial food, she felt on Janet's face in a corner. Not only that, though, she was then accused of killing a, a man's son in the sea. Uh, he went to visit the shore with his boy, and Donnie had the ability, oh sorry, Catherine had the ability to control the weather. She managed to quell the seas to help people's <coughs> husbands come back from fishing. And she got accused of making a sea rise and taking this young boy out to sea. But yeah, she was also accused of uh, cursing somebody by leaving a bundle of grasses in someone's spinning as well. She kind of got put in her reputation on hanging out to her the first time. So one of the people didn't like her anymore because of the boil, so she's, she just basically uh, was found guilty of witchcraft when she was then thrown principal of the Ashes to death. Um, but what is interesting about Catherine Crimby's trial, I'll touch on after why the cosmology is important. There's three stones. They're talked of the earth stone, the, the ebb stone, the, the hill stone, and then the earth stone. In Celtic mythology, we, uh, or cosmology, we know that they revered the earth, the land, and the water. What I find really, really interesting, and this is just my own thoughts about this, the earth, the land, and the water, the sky, the land, and the water. So what I find really interesting in this is that it's almost like the Kirk spirit. God. Kind of took over from the sky cosmology, maybe. I don't know, this is just me maybe thinking. But more potentially interesting is that they don't mention four elements. There's no circle casting, there's no wands, there's no nothing about how these stones are used, apart from they represented these two things. And as Greg was talking about in terms of like elf shop. There's lots of literature around people being infected by hill spirits and sea spirits and sky spirits and the hell spirits. And it kind of fits into that three-layered kind of view of the world. Do you, do you kind of see why it's interesting? Again, it's just me, maybe, I guess so, but more work's needed. So, using the stones for sport poking is so much better. Yeah. So, one way of using the stones and I'll show you the stones if you haven't seen them, that might be good. I tied them together as well. Thank you. So strong. So what, traditionally, if, uh, do you know what being forespoken is? If you're forespoken, are you familiar with that term? If you're forespoken, someone's giving you the evil eye. Or you've been hit by an elf It's more the evil eye. So what people would do is they would get a bucket of water and then they would do this over the top with their right hand and say same, same means bless. 
And then what they would do is read out this charm. Um, in the name of him that can cure or kill, this water shall cure all earthly ill. So cure the blood and flesh and bone. The equal arm that there is a storm. Nation fled in trouble, sickness, pain. Cure without, cure within. Cure the heart and form and skin. Why I put this up there, because it says again, there's triads of things that you're trying to fix. And it's also saying with this phrase here, the equal arm there is a stone. Each one there is a stone. So you put these things in the water, and you would say this charm, and then what you would do, I don't have a bucket of water yet, what you would put three palm poles over someone's head, and then you would put three palm poles over the fire, and you would say, well, fire turned envy. Fire will turn envy. I've just got another one here as another example, but that's not my favorite. <laughs> so I'll just skip over that. So, Catherine Craigie was quite famous or her use of scary stories. Do you want to know how she used them? Because it's a practice that you can apply today. <coughs> so there's another two bits of interesting cosmology we need to just focus on, is the idea of the hearth and the lintel stone. So for anyone familiar with Scottish folk magic practices, it's the liminal spaces that are really important. So it's your hearth, your lintel, sometimes the four corners of your bed, uh, from wake to sleep, dawn, dust, those kind of times, when everything is betwixt. So with this in mind, Catherine Craigie actually healed Jonet's husband this way, and this is how we have an explanation. So he was very sick, and he was in his sark, his ship, and <clears throat> Catherine was like, I need to check, basically, if it is a Kirk spirit that I think I pray to impact on your life, and made you sick is the thing. So Catherine took the three stones and she would put them on the back of the curve. So on the back. At the daybreak, if my memory serves, so it's daybreak. Or is it evening? Oh no, it's evening. She put them on the evening, daybreak. What are the times? <laughs> and then she would leave, leave it till the next dawn or dusk. And then she would pick up the stones and she would put them under the lintel. And then at daybreak of the next day, so you know, in dusk, up in the lintel. She would get a bucket of water, she would say in the water, and then she would drop the three stones into the water. She would name the three stones before they went around the hearth. And whichever stone hit the bucket that chimed and churned, that is making noise, that would indicate the spirit that was affecting John Acrady's husband. And then what she would do, she would get the water, similar to the spoken water, three handfuls on his head and wash them down with it, sometimes when Jonet was there, sometimes when Jonet wasn't. <laughs> and she would repeat the process another two times. So it's literally kind of over the course of three days. So we've got three times three, and handfuls is three. It's pretty significant, because if you have a nine in the folk magic, it kind of, it's almost like saying shorthand is forever, like three times three times. And this is how she would use the steering stone in, in, in working out, the, like the divining the spirit that kind of had, had impacted the person. So then what she would do with this frightened, terrified man that she'd been watching for three days, apparently, they were just aghast that this had happened and they were so sick. They couldn't say no, because if they'd said anything else, they would be in trouble for witchcraft too. But they were so aghast, it was really creepy. She would take them down to the lock edge. So if it was a real system, that indicated from the Epstone, she would take them down to the water's edge, she would make them undress, and then she would tip the water from the bucket of water over their head downstream in the rock so it wouldn't touch them. If it was a Kirk spirit, she would take them to the church at midnight, nobody was allowed to talk, and they would walk Joshua round the church three times, and then she would leave, and then nobody was allowed to speak. And obviously, if it was a hillstone, they would go up to the hill. This was because it was believed that where they were, the spirit of the place had affected them. So it's like an animus mindset, if you like. So the hill spirit, the water spirit, or the Kirk spirit were seen as things that you could catch in that kind of way. Does that all kind of make sense? Hmm. So this is where the skiri stones have come from, where the snake stones have come from. Interestingly, I'm going to touch on Alexander from that time. Yeah, Alexander Drummond used it differently. He 
used to hang stones around people's necks, and he lost one of them, and he said, I would gladly pay £2,000 to get that, because it was really important. But he also used to use plants and herbs. What he used to do is take rowan berries, hag berries, or hawthorn berries, and mud water, or mud that, as it's <laughs> written. And he would burn them over the fire, and it would, it would turn them to ash, and then he would fold it into a receipt. It's not clear whether they drank it, carried it, or what they did with it, rubbed it on their person. And he was really, really adept uh, at curing madness, basically. That's what he used to cure it for. Other people did other things with them. It's more detailed in the book if you want to read it, because we are up against it. But thank you so much. I'll hand over to Amanda, and she's going to tell you all about it.